Uh, hello everyone, my name is Daniel Boluza. I work at NXP, mainly, mainly enabling the audios IP that can be found on i.mx MPUs. And also I'm taking care of enabling the DSP that uh, exists on some cords. So uh, is anyone here doing audio? Okay, oh, okay, nice. Uh, anyone doing audio on Linux kernel? Great, and thank you. So today's presentation is about uh, sound upon firmware and how do we, we enable it on uh, ARM64 cores. The presentation is um, split like this. We'll start with some audio basics and a solution overview. And then we will go into the three software components that we have. Let's say we have a hypervisor to separate the core on which we run the firmware. We have a Linux driver, and then we have the Zephyr that runs the actual firmware. So first, some minor details about um, anatomy of an embedded system on an SOC. There is a digital audio interface, which uh, is on the SOC, it, and its uh, scope is to get the num some numbers from memory and convert them to digital audio signals. Then we have a codec, which is goal is to take the digital audio and transform it in analog audio. Of course, we have the, the, the other path when we are doing the recording and we are converting the analog signal to digital signal and then to numbers. We do have some helpers IPs, like the DMA, and uh, some other uh, helper IP, like a sample rate converter. Now, let's see the um, general overview of the solution. We have two cores. One, uh, it's an application processor that usually run Linux. And the other one, a secondary core, is the core that runs the firmware. The architecture of sound upon firmware is tightly coupled by the ALSA interface and by the uh, Linux driver. The Linux driver uh, job is to take the firmware image, load it somewhere in memory, and then start the DSP that runs the firmware. Um, another uh, specific thing to Linux is that the audio pipeline is encoded in a special file format named topology, and that format is loaded by the Linux kernel, is parsed, and each component and each uh, link in the pipeline is sent to the firmware which takes care of creating the and holding the audio, top audio topology. Of course, we have some tools for debugging, for, for runtime run configuration, and some other uh, stuff for specific image formats, but we won't uh, go into detail for that. Now, let's see the hardware, and we'll see a little bit of a history with the sound open firmware. So this is the uh, i.mx M plus processor, which has a main CPU with several ARM cores, and it does have this Hi-Fi 4 uh, Tenslica DSP. We started with sound upon firmware uh, based on uh, Extens OS, and that works, worked pretty fine for, uh, for this uh, kind of architecture, but it didn't, it didn't work for the next generation of audio where we don't have a DSP. You see here, this is the i.mx95 application processor, which has uh, up to six ARM cores, but no DSP. So we needed a way in which we run the same solution uh, on this new hardware. And that, uh, the help for us was that we switched from Extens OS to Zephyr, and Zephyr has support for ARM64. So we were able to run the firmware on the ARM64 core. Now, some small introduction about the sound upon firmware. This is an audio open source firmware and SDK plus tooling. The Linux kernel part has BSD GPL license driver. The firmware part has BSD MIT license drivers. It was initially started by Intel uh, and on the DSP family from Cadence, from Hi-Fi 2, 3, 4, and so on. It was designed by people working on the Linux kernel and the design shows that in the way that everything and the modules and the platform independency is organized similarly with the Linux kernel. So the driver is platform agnostic. It runs on x86 on Intel and AMD platform. 
and on ARM64 on NXP platforms. Also, the firmware was created with platform in independency in mind, right? And the modules are separated, so the only thing that you need to change when going from one platform to the other is the specific layer that is tied to the hardware. The rest of the components should stay the same. Uh, all right. This is a very, very high level overview of the Linux stack. Those of you who done Linux in kernel knows that it's much more than that. But for the sake of the presentation, it's enough for us to get the general idea. It, we start with the user space applications that usually that use the ALSA interface. In the Linux kernel, we have the ALSA stack, which has several components. And we have some drivers for the hardware IP, for the codec, for the digital audio interface, and usually we use DMA to move data, data around. Uh, when we use a normal uh, ARM system without a DSP and everything in the audio world is handled by the ARM cores, this is how things are looking like. Now, when we introduce the DSP, some of the hardware is now managed by the DSP. And here we have the, some of the digital audio interfaces, DMAs, uh, are handled by the DSP. Um, and some other parts, like the codecs, are handled by ARM. You see here that it's, it's a natural separation by the design of the hardware. Now, and of course, here we introduce a concept of messaging, of messaging unit, which is a hardware IP that allows two cores to communicate between them. It's very common on NXP platforms. It, of course, it exists on other platforms, but the naming is different. All right, now what we do we don't have a, if we don't have a DSP and we don't have the natural separation that the hardware provides when we have a DSP. Well, we introduce a hypervisor. Uh, the hypervisor that we are using is Jailhouse. And with the help of this hypervisor, we try to do the separation, right? And what we do, we reserve one ARM core to be somehow replace the DSP. And then, with the help of the jailhouse hypervisor, we separate the devices. We allocate the DMA and the digital audio interfaces to the core that is running the firmware, and we allow the, uh, the rest of the core to run the rest of the hardware IPs. Now, very simple information about the jailhouse hypervisor. Um, it is a static partitioning hypervisor, and how it works, it first boots, lin so you first boot normal Linux, and then you load the hypervisor, and the hypervisor will separate cores and resources into what is called a cell. We have the root cell that continues to run the Linux, and we have the other core that's reserved that will run the firmware. And we have here some commands. It, it has a user space API, from which you can create cells, delete cells, start firmware in a cell, and, and so on. And here what we do is create configuration file that describe the resources allocated to the secondary core. We compile Zephyr, we load Zephyr at a certain address, and then using J Jailhouse we start the firmware on the secondary core. And this is... Uh, all that we want to know about the separation. After that, we are now again in the case that we had for the DSP, where one cord was reserved for additional work. Now for the sound, sound open firmware Linux driver, uh, this is the anatomy of the sound open firmware driver application. This is all in the ALSA layer. We have the machine driver. The machine driver is a piece of software that takes care of taking the digital audio interface driver, codec driver, and linking them together, taking care of the configuration, uh, parameters, and things like that. That's standard in the uh, ASOC world. And each time you want to create a sound card for your audio system, you need to create a machine driver where you describe your audio system. You describe the digital audio links, the codec, and the way they are connected. Next layer is the PCM layer. Uh, 
which in Sound Open Format takes uh, care um, about some stuff, like topology. It takes care of taking the audio pipeline description, parsing it, and sending commands to the firmware in order to create, on firmware side, the pipeline that we have. Typically, an audio pipeline can contain components like a volume, like a mixer, or like uh, com more complex components like an uh, audio echo canceller. Uh, then we have an IPC layer, and because uh, this was written with platform agnosticity in mind, it has first a generic IPC driver, and then each platform needs to implement uh, its hardware specifics. Like, for example, with NXP, we need to add a uh, messaging unit driver, we need to find a way uh, from which we share uh, audio buffers from Linux to the DSP. Uh, here also resides the code loader. Uh, you, you, we use uh, the, the firmware interface from a Linux kernel where we read the firmware from user space, parse it and uh, put it in memory and then start the DSP. Um, on this next slide is a short summary of what I have of the, the last, last picture, so we'll go over them. Um, I want to introduce you a little bit about the flow on how things work. So on the audio subsystem, uh, audio is handled by a sound card. A sound card is a bunch of um, interface and a bunch of files in user space, and the user has the possibility of writing audio data to the kernel or writing commands to the kernel. And what we do is we hook into these PCM operations, and instead of running the audio on ARM cores that's managed by the Linux, we forward all the information to the uh, uh, firmware, and the firmware takes care of uh, starting the stream on the running the audio application. Now we have some operations, like for example, when one disc opens the sound card, the action that happens is that we load the firmware and start it. Then we have a phase of configuring the firmware using this function, or triggering uh, an action on the stream, like for example, start stream, or stop stream, or resume stream, or suspend stream. And then the actual copying of the data from an audio file that sits in user space happens through the IOCTL interface. Now, on this image is a simple pipeline on the right side. We see some components like uh, host, mixer, and digital on your face. And let's see a simple flow of how this works. First, the, um, when the pipeline is loaded, when the topology is loaded, the Linux kernel parses all the commands and sends them one by one to the firmware. And then the firmware does like this, creates the host component, creates the mixer based on the commands that it received from the Linux, uh, and then creates the buffers. And there is a command to uh, actually link the components through the buffers. And um, when, for example, we want to start a stream, an audio application from user space will issue a command. The Linux kernel takes care of it, encapsulates it in a special message, sends it to the firmware, and the firmware actually uh, interprets that command. So for example, if we want to mix two streams, we open two streams and we start them, and each of the commands is forward to the correct pipeline. Next, um, what types of commands do we have? For example, we have commands that applies to stream, like for example, setting the parameters or uh, suspending the stream. We do have commands that are uh, related to the topology. Like, for example, we want to create a component or to create a buffer or to link the components between them. And commands related to power management. This is uh, one thing that uh, is by design in the SOF. This is the, the, the custom protocol that it implements. And we'll see later that it's kind of a limitation for us to switch from this to a core and a system that doesn't have the Linux kernel. Like, for example, the MCUs, which do not run Linux, and we want to enable SOF on that. But we'll discuss more on that later. 
Uh, and of course, for the Linux part, the last side is the, the utilities. We have a logging system, a, a custom logging system with messages that are written in memory. And switching to Zephyr, now we are uh, investigating how to actually use the Zephyr logger instead of our custom system. Uh, we have the, uh, the images is in a special format, so it's not an ELF. Uh, the ELF is encapsulated in a special format and sent to the Linux kernel, so that the Linux kernel doesn't know about actually parsing ELF. It just knows about this format, which is easier to interpret and parse. And we have a, a tool that allows you to runtime configure the pipeline. So for example, if you have a, an equalizer and you want to change the uh, coefficients, you can do that at runtime by uh, issuing a command from user space that goes to Linux and then to goes, goes to the firmware. Um, OK, so that was where the first parts where we thought about Linux and Zephyr and um, hypervisor. Now let's see a little bit about how we actually managed to enable this on um, uh, ARM64 core. Uh, I think some of this stuff I already mentioned. Uh, we started, it's important to understand the history, uh, Intel started with the uh, firmware running on hi-fi platforms. Uh, I assume that they initially got the, the proprietary firmware from uh, Extensa, and then they decided to create something open. And then we are working on the same project using the custom firmware from Extensa. And then we've seen the sound open firmware announced at a conference, and we decided to use it. Um, the design is clearly made by people working with Linux. It's configurable. Uh, uses kconfig, similar with Zephyr and Linux. And you can select which components do you want on your firmware. If you have a firmware with memory limitation, you can remove out the code that you don't need. Uh, and now we are gradually switching to Zephyr. The first part was already done with uh, supporting Extensa. Also, the fact that Zephyr supports ARM64 was of a great help for us because we could easily uh, use the existing support and only add the things that are not present. Um, OK, so the example that we are working on is uh, it's already upstream. It's the support for i.mx93 AVK A55 port. This is the name that we've got. So in order to support sound open firmware as an application, first we created the board. Then we created an application and uh, custom overlays and kconfig fragments and added this application on top of uh, of the existing board. Um, we'll see later on the components that SOF already has and what's the effort on keeping only the audio logic in Sound of Conformer and moving everything else into Zephyr, like moving all the drivers into Zephyr and moving all the OS primitive in, into the Zephyr. But now we'll discuss about how to add support for the uh, IMX 93 AVK A55 port. And there is a very useful guide, which I walked through over many, many times, about how to add support for a new board. First, we need to start with the architecture, and it is ARM64. Luckily, this is already supported. We only need to understand how to be used. So in order to enable this, you need to enable config ARM64 which will later bring more configuration symbols into, uh, into the picture. Next is to select the CPU core. CPU core is Cortex-A55. We needed to define this symbol and to select uh, appropriate symbols to enable and to drag with it. Next, there is the SOC family and SOC series. SOC series for us is IMX. SOC series for us is i.mx9, right? And here you have to define and to create a set of kconfigs um, and uh, add this directory structure right? when you add your SOC series. And based on that, you actually add your instance of the SOC. And we named that i.mx93a55, and this needs to select at least the basic support, 
first time when you're enabling a board, the basic support to run the Hello World application or the synchronization application. Uh, and in order for to do that, we have the board, which only needs these uh, six IPs in order to be able to boot uh, the serial console and to run a simple sample that prints something on the console or creates some threads and does some synchronization with it. Uh, so we enable the CPU, the timer, the controller. All of these three are generic ARM IPs. And then some specific IPs to uh, NXP like the UART. Luckily, all of these were already there. We only needed to instantiate them. So at this point, we have a board. And what remains to be done is to add your actual application. And uh, here we learned that inside your application, if you create a directory app, you can uh, annotate and, to, and, and add over the existing DTS. For example, we added the A55 overlay, which is a DTS fragment file, which is appended to the board uh, DTS. And then we added a config fragment, which enabled the options that were only needed by the SOF. As you can see there, there are other boards supported, like 8, 8M, and 8X. And we had an example on how to enable our board. Uh, next, you just compile the board with West, and you get the binary. right? And you use uh, Jailhouse, as we discussed later, to load uh, the firmware and, and start it running. So un until this point, we have support for the so-called board which is IDOTMX93. Now, what we do with the actual application? This is the architecture of the sound open firmware arch architecture, and we have a part which contains only the audio components. These are open-coded C files, and sometimes we have um, vendors that cannot offer the C file or the source code, but they only offer a binary with the uh, algorithm implemented there. We have a module that takes care of uh, proprietary binaries. Then there is the generic microkernel module, which takes care of all OS primitives, like the booting parts, the interrupts, timers, and everything that you need to have a working operating system. And last are the platform drivers, which uh, the ones that are familiar with audio on NXP are uh, SI and EDMA. Uh, controllers, and we have others, but these are the, the most common on the NXP uh, MPU platforms. Now, um, in order to run SOF with Zephyr, we only need this part. Uh, we need to hook our OS support into Zephyr, uh, meaning that, for example, functions like creating a thread need to go into the OS core of Zephyr and uh, call that function for creating a thread. Uh, the porting the audio components is not required. I mean, this is the only thing that we want to keep in sound open firmware. And platform drivers, for the moment, most of them are inside SOF source code. Uh, there is an effort to port them to Zephyr and remove them from here. We'll see what's the status on that. So, the adding support only for the Zephyr RTOS in sound open firmware uh, allowed us to have an, a working application. And here is an example on how do you change the API that SOF is using to be hooked into Zephyr. So for this uh, example, here is a function for uh, registering an interrupt uh, number with a handler. And uh, what you need to do is just to find the equivalent function in Zephyr and add it here. And then it just compiles. On the right side, you see all the OS interface that needs to be adapted to use Zephyr. Uh, most of them are just trivial uh, name, name, name function renaming or calling the function with the parameters in other order, because when we designed first SOF, we didn't have uh, Zephyr to look at, and we put some parameters in some order. So once you've done this, 
you have um, support for SOF. Next step would be to completely remove the wrappers and use native uh, calls from Zephyr. But this will imply that we need to completely quit the ex ex extends OS support, which uh, is, uh, for the moment, it's a discussion in the community if we should go full Zephyr, or if we keep uh, extends OS support, or add more uh, support for, like, free RTOS. There are some companies wanting to go one way, some in other way. We'll need, and we'll see we, uh, when we'll reach an agreement about this. Now, uh, next part is, taking the drivers from SOF and moving them to Zephyr. Intel already started on some drivers, and the first driver they looked at is a driver for the digital audio interfaces. Uh, as you might know, in uh, Zephyr, the audio support is pretty light. There is some small I2S I uh, API, but that didn't fit the need of the uh, SOF, and what uh, the community did is created another API, which is called Digital Audio Interface, and the interface can be found in Zephyr Drivers Die.h. And what does this API do? It just emulates the operations that were already in SOF, and functions like uh, probe, remove, configuration, and the trigger function. Once this is done, uh, they've already ported some, some of their uh, digital audio interfaces there, and uh, they are working with that. For us, for NXPIPs, we have uh, SI and ESI, which are not yet ported, but we plan to do that. The next thing that we need to port are the DMA drivers. Luckily here, the API was pretty much the same, so we haven't need to do uh, any extra work. The only thing that was added in Zephyr were the suspend and resume handlers for the DMA, which were not present. Which, with that added, uh, the um, Intel started to port their drivers. Luckily for us, eDMA driver is already in Zephyr, so we could use it directly from there. Um, now, this is the last slide. Um, and this is the things that we need to think how to do it. So, for example, how do we port the messaging unit interface? In Zephyr, there is already a driver named IPMI.mx, which is for the messaging unit device. But I looked a little bit at it, and the interface doesn't really fit our needs, so we need to understand how to, to do that. Then we have to add support for interrupt steer, which is some sort of interrupt controller, and Zephyr already has an API for interrupt controllers. We need to understand if this API fits our needs. Then the design that we are currently having uh, uses clocks and power management, but those are enabled by Linux. And the uh, next step for us would be to allow each device on, side, on Zephyr side to enable its own clocks and in its own power domains. For us, it was easier to enable it from Linux, but this is not really the correct way. And one thing that uh, we uh, want to propose you for a little discussion is on how do we run sound up on firmware application on a system that doesn't have uh, support for Linux, on, like, for example, the MCUs. How do we port sound up on firmware on um, i.mx RT boards? And with that, uh, my presentation is over. I would uh, happily take questions or ideas on how to decouple this from Linux. And hopefully, uh, I think SOF would be the start of creating a proper audio stack in Zephyr. It already did some steps, but there is a long way until we have a proper audio stack. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you move uh, uh, EDMA uh, control over to uh, the Zephyr core. Does that mean that uh, it has exclusive access to the DMA and uh, prevents the Linux system from using the EDMA? Uh, technically, yes. Uh, but in theory, I think uh, Linux might have control over it. 
uh, it depends on the platform. But in theory, uh, in practice on how we did it, now uh, Zephyr has exclusive access to uh, that uh, device. And I think it's even more clear with the jailhouse solution where you actually separate and you say, for this address area, only that core has addresses. Uh, a couple of suggestions and one question. Mm -hmm. uh, for the messaging unit, instead of looking to the IPM, uh, you should look to Mbox, really. Uh, for which one? To the uh, Mbox API. Ah, uh, Mbox, okay, right. which is on top of this one? Yeah, no, it's, it's not on top. It's something, uh, IPM, I consider it a bit legacy, Mbox. Uh, it's oh, an evolution okay. of the IPM, but it's much more complete because uh, it supports multiple channels, for, for example, oh, okay. while IPM does not. So maybe you want to look at, at the Mbox API instead of the IPM. Uh, also, for for decoupling the firmware from the host to S, uh, maybe an idea uh, uh, would be looking at the libmetal. Okay. The, the problem right now is that all the configuration and all the setup for the firmware is done via uh, commands from Linux kernel. Okay. Uh, and that, that, that comes to my next question. So, like, uh, for the IPC, like, there is a, re a reason you do not want to have that managed by uh, Zephyr because in, in one of your previous slides, uh, yeah, uh, back. So it, it's, yeah, so you want also IPC to be managed by Zephyr or you want uh, it to be something? Because in Zephyr we have a pretty nice IPC. I, IPC uh, has two parts. One that's it's managed from Zephyr and the other that's managed right. for Linux and that's they communicate. Yeah. In the scenario where we get rid of Linux, I don't think we will need an IPC layer because there isn't another entity to which we should communicate. So we can remove that part. But what we need is we need some sort of a statical configuration maybe assigned in SOF, which encodes the audio pipeline, mm -hmm. for example. Which components do you have and what are the links between them? Right now, this what, uh, what happens is that Linux reads a file mm -hmm. with a configuration, parses it, and sends it to Zephyr. Okay. Uh, and in this way, we can rapidly change the audio scenario. Like you load the topology, you do your thing, you unload it, and you load, uh, maybe you load another one. And you do you do that using a shared memory, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's shared memory with a doorbell. Okay, and you use many transport protocol, right? Yeah, we have a custom protocol. Oh right, so no, not RPMSG. message. No RPMSG. Okay. Although this could be a, a suggestion that we should look into it. Okay. And also we have a custom protocol for loading the firmware instead right. of using the remote proc, for example. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like no other questions. Thank okay. you very much for Thank your presentation. You.